the book of Esther, quite a book. And uh, I'll resist the temptation to recount the book. You've just spent, you know, a whole series of, well, what's it been, about four weeks, I guess, going through it, verse by verse. But I've reserved some of the discoveries of the book near the end so they don't distract us from the continuity of the narrative. And um, so that there are a number of little tidbits that we'll discover are in the text that we've reserved as sort of an appendix to our study. And they fall into two categories. Uh, my background, as you know, has been the information sciences. And there are things called microcodes and macrocodes. Microcodes are codes or idioms having to do with letters or parts thereof. They're, they're, they're small parts, small elements. Macrocodes are more over broader, broad brush kinds of things. There's two groups of these things. But the book of Esther, many people who know nothing else about the book have heard of the, that the name of God does not appear in the book. Well, it's interesting that the name Esther means, that the Persian name Esther means something hidden. And that, that's not a speculation. It's Cassinius, one of the greatest Hebrew lexicons around. Make that. There are hidden codes, and we're going to discover there are five acrostics and three equidistant letter sequences, and I'll explain what those are as we go. And there's one little, I'll call it a chuckle at the end. But the microcodes. First of all, there's a thing called an acrostic. What is an acrostic? It's a repetition of the same or successive letters at the beginning of words or clauses. Psalm 111, Psalm 112. The most well-known one is the longest psalm in the Bible. Psalm 119 consists of 22 stanzas, eight lines each, but each line starts with a successive letter of the alphabet. And it's just designed that way, and it's well-known for that reason. Now, there is a thing called an acronym. That's an acrostic but it's usually one that's used for mnemonic purposes, and I'll explain that in a minute. It's a special type of ac acrostic. There's another term you don't hear that often, it's not which is a, an acrostic composed of initial letters of su successive sentences. We generally call that alliteration. You'll discover most pastors that were raised in a seminary, they love to have the main points of their sermon all start with the same letter. And, and uh, somehow that makes them more true, I guess, or something. But in any case, it's a, it's a pattern. Now, there are a number of psalms that are acrostics in the, in the Hebrew alphabet. I've mentioned several of those already, but Psalm 119, I've summarized already, is, is uh, uh, each paragraph begins with the, the same letter and so on. Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31, includes a special emphasis with each of the 22 verses, beginning with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's also a form of an acrostic, where each is successive. And in the book of Lamentations, each of the four chapters is organized around 22 letters of the alphabet. So we notice that there is a Jewish uh, preoccupation with textual structure, and we see that all through uh, the uh, uh, um, scripture. Now, mnemonic uh, acrostics are a, a mechanism to just to help you remember, uh, usually an abbreviation. For example, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. If, you in, if you're in an environment where you use that very often, you quickly call it NASA, right? It's just shorter and simpler. What most people may not know, that follows in a mathematical law. If you take, if you were to record all the words you spoke, say, uh, in a, a day, and took all the words, all the phonemes, but say all the words, and rank ordered them by frequency, you discover that the, 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 the rank order times the frequency you used it is a constant. You'd also discover if you deviate from that, you're not being efficient. That's called Ziff's Law. It was discovered in the 30s. And most people don't realize that, but there, is, there are laws of behavior. And if there's, a, if there's a, a, a word you start using a lot, you'll find an abbreviation for that to shorten it. That's called the uh, principle of least effort. And uh, anyway, North, North Atlantic Tree Organization, we call NATO. Uh, during World War II, we had radar detection and ranging, a big invention. It could quickly be called radar, right? It's a lot easier. Some of those longer terms are tough. In the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew for the Old Testament, is also an acronym of the Torah, Nabim, and the Kathibim, and uh, uh, so forth. So, and there's even actually uh, collections of acronyms acronomania, if you will, uh, that have been published. I have no idea what use they'd be, but they are around. But acrostics also can serve to provide hidden messages. And uh, it's, a, it's a mechanism. 
for that. In the book of Esther, we encounter some remarkable surprises. You say the book of the name of God doesn't appear. Wrong. It appears eight times. I'll show you. It's been noted by many commentators. Esther is the only book of the Bible in which the, does not appear the name of God. Well, uh, or anywhere in the book. Martin Luther favored eliminating it from the Bible on this basis. Here's a quote from his writings. I am so great an enemy to the second book of the Maccabees and to Esther that I wish they had not come to us at all. For they have too many heathen unnaturalities. The Jews much more esteemed the book of Esther than any of the prophets, though they were forbidden to read it before they had attained the age of 30 by reason of the mystic matters it contains. That's Martin Luther. He not only is wrong about Esther, he's also wrong about the 30. That, that, that applies to the Song of Solomon, not the book of Esther. But anyway, we won't get into all that here. We're not here to upset people about Martin Luther. He's a, he was a great leader in many ways. But across his hidden messages, you see, the name of God does appear in a number of places if you know how to look for it. And uh, so the, the foiling of the wicked plot of Haman to blot out the Jews, of course, is one of the more dramatic narratives in the Bible. Furthermore, beyond the surprises in the plot, there are also some surprises hidden within the text itself. And that's what we're going to play around with tonight. And one of the many ways, of course, is an acrostic and a, a systematic sequence of letters in the text which can also have meaning or significance of its own. It's a code of skipping letters. We're going to look at two different kinds. We're going to look at acrostics as a form of skipping letters and we'll be looking at what's called an equidistant letter sequence as a specialized kind. But anyway, one of the simplest form of acrostic is simply the repetition of the same or successive letters at the beginning of clauses. Now, God declared back in Deuteronomy 31 that if his people forsook him, he would hide his face from them. So he's hiding his face from them, but that doesn't mean he's not watching out for them. That's the paradox that's being dealt with here. So here in this very episode, that threat was fulfilled. That even though he was hidden from them, God is still working for them. And the name of God is hidden no less than eight times in acrostics in the text. The first acrostic we'll take a look at. It appears at the conclusion of Memucan's counsel regarding the disposition of Queen Vasti, back in chapter 1, verse 20. And it's shown as I'm showing you here. But if you take the first, of each, first letter of each word, bear in mind, let's back up a minute. All letters flow, all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? All nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Hebrew, Arabic, um, Aramaic, Sanskrit, it goes on and on. Those nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Latin and all its derivatives, Greek, you name it. So, so the first letter is highlighted here on the slide. And if you take those letters and put them together, you have, anyway, the name of God. It's formed by the, I want you to notice here, it's formed by the initial letters, and it is right in, it's here, you may not recognize because it's backwards. yod heh vav is, goes in the other direction. yod heh vav it goes left to right the way we're reading it, that's backwards for Hebrew. It's in here, backwards. And we're going to get into the forward and backward, front letter, back letter. That's all done deliberately, I'll explain as we go here. It's playing backward because God is turning back the counsels of man, which is memory can. Okay? The second acrostic occurs when Esther invites the king and Haman to a banquet. That's in chapter 5, verse 4. And that's what it looks like in the Hebrew. And here again, if you take the first letter of each word, it spells yod heh vav -Heh. And this God is initiating the action, and it's forward because God is ruling and causing Esther to act. Okay? I'll summarize this in a little chart at the end here. The third acrostic occurs in chapter 5, verse 13, and that's what it looks like. And here's another one of these where it's backwards, if you will. yod heh but backwards. The final letters, because Haman's end was approaching, it's backwards because... Oh, by the way, I have to catch you on that. In this case, we're not using the first letter of each word, we're using the last letter of each word, and we're doing it backwards. It's the final letters because Haman's end is approaching. It's backwards because God is overruling Haman's gladness and turning back Haman's counsel. And uh, what's, you say, well, that you're contriving it. No, you'll say, this is consistently being applied throughout all of these. The fourth one is in chapter 7, verse 7, like the third, is formed by the final letters for Haman's end had come. So again, we're taking the last letter of each word. And uh, 
We have yod heh vav -Heh forward now. It's spelled forward like the first, for God is ruling and bringing about the end that he had determined. Okay? That, you, all, you got that all down? <laughs> okay. The overall design in each of these four acrostics revealing yod heh vav -Heh involves the utterance of a different speaker. First one was Memucan, second one was Esther, third one was Haman himself, the fourth one was the writer of the book of Esther. Got that so far? All right. The first two acrostics are a pair having the name formed by the initial letters of the four words. The last two are a pair having the name formed by the final letters of the two words. You with me so far? Okay. It's remarkable that in the two cases where the name is formed by the initial letters, the facts recorded are initial also. That in an occasion where God's overruling counsel uh, was initiated, in the last two cases where the name is formed by the final letters, the events are final also and lead quickly to the end toward which God was working. So we find that the, 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 the structure of the acrostics are almost acting like transitive verbs in the direction that they're pointing. In the two cases where the name is spelled backwards, God is seen overruling the counsels of the Gentiles uh, in the accomplishment of his own things. Where the name is spelled forward, he is ruling directly in the interests of his own people, although it was unknown to them at the time. All I'm getting, you don't need to remember the details, the point I'm getting across, it is designed deliberately. That's the real, that's the overwhelming impact of this to me. That the, even the letter, the order of the letters, the way it's, they aren't just, they tuck these cards, you know, they're, 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 they're integral with what's going on. We have initial, initial, and final, and final. And they're initial because the facts are initial. They're final because the facts are final. The first one is backward. The second one is forward. The third one is backward. The fourth one is forward. They're backward because they're Gentiles. They're forward if they're Israelites. If they're done forward, it's the Hebrew. If they're going backwards, the Gentiles. That's kind of interesting to me. I think that's... The more you embrace that, see, there's no two alike, but the each difference has a reason for being different. And these are not my contrived things. This is out of the Talmud. These are Talmudically recognized by most rabbis. They have introversion. Of the, words, the first one, words were spoken concerning a queen. The second one, words were spoken by a queen. The third one, words were spoken by Haman. The fourth one, words were concerning Haman. You see the introversion going on here. The first and the first and last is the subject matter. The second and third were the source of the quote. And again, the first two queen, the last two Haman. Well, there's a fifth acrostic that has a little different picture. It's in chapter seven, verse five. It doesn't spell Yodhevave, Yahweh, as some people would say. But rather the remarkable Ichyach, the I am that I am, the voice, the name that God used from the burning bush. And when we look at this here, we have that Ichyach, if you will, but again it's backwards. The I am, if you will. I am that I am. Jesus claimed to be that voice in the burning bush in the Gospel of John seven times. It is formed by the final letters, and the name is spelled backward. Final letters spelled backwards. Why? This appears in the dramatic moment when the king sees the identity, seeks the identity. You remember when, when the last banquet and he says that, you know, that, that her, she and her people are in danger, right? And the king is shocked, fortunately. And he bursts out, king speaking, who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? Remember that was, that, was, that was the pivotal moment for Xerxes. And when he finds out it's Haman, he's so, he has to actually leave the room. He's so enraged. But this is, this is the key pinnacle here. And he, he, this is to arrange for the destruction of Queen Esther and her people. Who's doing that? This is the point. This is the key thing. Hidden in this phrase is the very name of God that was announced in the burning bush, the I Am, the very name of God announced when he delivered his people out of the land of Pharaoh in the past and who has now come to deliver them again out of the hand of Haman. 
See the parallel. How appropriate it is to use that same name as he did with regards to the deliverance from Egypt. Well, that's the acrostics in Esther. I couldn't deal with acrostics without tucking in one of my favorites. Somebody asked me earlier, what's one of my favorites? This is one of my favorite acrostics. Pilate did this. Pontius Pilate. In John 19, a titlon it's called. It's, his, it's Pilate's official label that he put on the cross, the crucifixion, the titlon. It was the official announcement from the official representative of the ruler of the world. He wrote it himself in three languages. He wrote it in Hebrew himself, apparently. That's what John records. He wrote it in Hebrew, because that's the Jewish language. That's really what he's playing. He's playing games here with the Pharisees you'll see in a minute. It's written in Greek, because that's what most people in the region would speak. And he also did it in Latin, because that was becoming the official language of the Roman Empire. It was getting established. So it's written first in Hebrew. The first letter of each of the four words spell out a tetragrammaton. That's what I want to show you here. This is what's recorded in John 19. Pilate wrote a title, or titlon, put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And I have to tell you, I'm impressed. Because I wouldn't have, you know, I, 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 that, that Pilate, he obviously spoke Greek and Latin. But that he apparently picked up enough Hebrew to, to get them really upset, as you'll see in a minute. Here's what he wrote. That's what he wrote on the titlon from right to left. The first word there is Yeshua. The next word is Hanatzerai, the, Nazar the Nazarene. Vemelech, uh, the Nazareth. Uh, Vemelech, Ha Yehudin. Four words in Hebrew. Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Are we together? That's what it looks like. Except. Uh, you notice something in the next verse in John. The chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, they said, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. They want it rephrased. You'll see why. You, you and I from the English can't tell why they want it rephrased. I'll show you why they want it rephrased. But I want you to notice what Pilate answered. What I have written, I have written. You sort of see Yul Brenner saying that somehow, don't you? What I have written will always remain written, is what it really translates from the Greek. Okay? What's going on here? Why are they so upset? I'll show you why. The Jews are into acrostics. It's intrinsic in their literature. They looked at this. Yeshua, Hanatzerai, Vimelech, HaYehudin. The first letter of each of those four words spell yod He vav He, the in unpronounceable name of God. They wanted that changed. Pilate says, what I have written will always remain written. I think, now whether he believed Jesus was the Son of God, that's a speculation. What I'm sure of, he knew that this would get there. He resented them putting him in this position. And uh, he, he knew that they it, it delivered him up for, out of envy. And he tried everything he could, administratively speaking, to get out from under that charge. And he resented the whole situation. So he put the needle in where it would hurt them. yod heh vav is on the cross. How true, how true. Well, these five acrostics in Esther are well known in Talmudic literature, the previous ones I had there. But I'm indebted to a dear friend of mine, Yaakov Ramsel. And uh, he passed away a year or two ago. Wrote several books, fortunately, before he passed away. But he was a dear friend, wrote me a note pointed out some things to me, and I checked it out, and he was right, and we became great friends for many reasons. And he's made many discoveries regarding, especially equidistant letter sequences. And I, I leaned heavily on some of his discoveries in my book called Cosmic Codes. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity. It's become a definitive text in this area, biblical cryptology. And uh, most people writing, and there's a lot of characters writing in this field, um, Jeffrey Sanover is a solid guy, but there's other guys that write that are really not believers. They're flaky, contrived. Uh, they're they're um, vacuous. But there are, uh, out of about 25 chapters in this book, there's only two or three on ELSs. 
The most interesting codes in the Bible are not the ELSs, but they're the ones that most people know about, and they, they become synonymous in many people's mind to Bible codes. No, they're just one of many different kinds. But we want to understand these. You know, uh, Rabbi Moses Cordovero in the 16th century said, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. We find that way, way, way back in the rabbinical traditions. What is an equidistant letter sequence, or short ELS for short? I'm going to put an imaginary sentence up here to show you what I mean. Here's a sentence. Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. So that's a sentence. It turns out, though, that if you happen to take the first letter, and then the f f four letters the fourth letter after that, 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 and so on, you end up with another message hidden in this message. What does this message say? Read the code, okay? Now, it's obviously a pretty trivial message and a pretty trivial me in a pr trivial message, but it gets the idea across, I can cr contrive to have another meaning emerge from some base text by playing around, okay? Sometimes that can happen just by statistical accident, and sometimes it happens because someone has taken the trouble to contrive it. And that, therein lies the, the, the challenge. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Yes, which are my favorite examples. This is one of my favorite ELSs here. And that's in uh, Genesis. If you take the book of Genesis, and the word in, for the books of Moses called the Torah, T-O-R-H, in, our, in our, our equivalent. If you go for the, to the first T, the first Tau, and write it down, and you count 49 letters, you get to a Vav. So you write that down. You, ca you count 49 letters, and you get a Res. And you count that 49 letters, and you get a He. Remember, it goes from right to left. That spells, in English, Torah. You say, well, that's kind of curious that it happens that in 49 intervals from the first how you get the word Torah labeling the book of Moses. That doesn't sound that impressive particularly. You go to the book of Exodus, and you discover the same thing. There's a Tau. There is 49 letters. There's a Vav. 49 letters. There's a Res. 49 letters. There's a He. And again, it spells Torah. Now, for it to happen twice, by accident is absurd. So someone's taken the trouble to push this around somehow, maybe. You get to Leviticus and it doesn't happen, and you almost feel a sigh of relief. When you get to Numbers, you, do something, you discover something even stranger. You find, again, if you count 49 letter intervals, you find it's spelled backwards. Now you wonder, somebody went through it. Now, I always wonder how they find that out. They must have had time on their hands. You know. But anyway, it's spelled, it's spelled backwards. When you get to Deuteronomy, the same equivalent thing happens. Again, it's spelled backwards. So now you're puzzled. Genesis and Exodus, it's spelled forward. Leviticus, it doesn't happen. Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's spelled backwards. Let's take another look at Leviticus. Instead of taking 49, let's take the square root of 49, 7, right? And it turns out, in intervals of 7, not 7 squared, 7, we have the unpronounceable name of God, yod heh Now you stand back from this architecture. You notice that in Genesis and Exodus, it's spelled forward. Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's spelled backwards. And Leviticus has the unpronounceable name of God. What's the architecture? The Torah always points to yod heh now, you try to convince me that that was accidental, a statistical rarity. You try organizing that, and you've got a job on your hands. That's non-trivial. But it's also interesting that if you take one letter out of the picture, it falls apart. This tells me not only did God give Moses the Torah, he gave it to him letter by letter. That's what Jesus meant in Matthew 5.18. Think not to come to, to uh, destroy the uh, Torah or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say to you, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass from the Torah until all be fulfilled. A yacht or a tittle are parts of a letter. You know, it's interesting. These, ev almost everything we know about in cryptography had its roots in the rabbinical Kabbalah, textual traditions. That led to the cryptology of the Renaissance. Most kings had on their staff 
Jewish rabbis that knew how to play games with cryptography. And that cryptography eventually developed mechanical aids. Thomas Jefferson had his wheels. There are all kinds of collector's items of the ancient coding wheels and so forth. That led in World War II to the elaborate Enigma machines of, of Nazi Germany. And to try to crack those codes, we had a major wartime development that led to the computer. John von Neumann in the United States and Alan Turing in Britain collaborated and to get a device that could un un unravel the Enigma. And prior to El Alamein, we never had a victory. Churchill pointed out, after El Alamein, we never had a, a loss. Because it was at, at, at El Alamein that we had cracked the, the Nazi code through, the, through the, this development. It's interesting, as those computers have gotten more and more elaborate and refined, the computers now have revealed to us some of the codes that were well known to the ancient rabbis. So the loop is sort of closed, interestingly enough. I'll give you some examples. The word Israel itself, in the first 10,000 letters of Genesis, dealing only in spaces of uh, less than 100, from minus 100 to plus 100, it only occurs twice as an encryption at the intervals of 7 and 50. Now, to a Jew, that's surprising. Why 7 and 50? Because the Kaddish, the Sabbath observance in, in Genesis 1, and the Jubilee are after seven smittas. The trees, in the end of chapter 2, chapter 1 of Genesis, the beginning of chapter 2, we have, God says, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, and, uh, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, it, do you sh it shall be for meat or for food. And chapter 2, open to early chapter, verse 9, says, Out of the ground the Lord God made grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Take that bracket from Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, and Genesis 2, verse 9. You discover there are 25 trees, different trees, in the Bible. And they're all encrypted within those few verses, from the end of chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 9. And uh, all the different, uh, all the trees that you find in the Bible are in encrypted there in the Hebrew. So that's kind of bizarre. What makes it strange isn't that they're there, is they're exactly where trees are introduced in the scripture. There's another thing. Um, Rabbi Hirsch says that the Jews' catechism is his calendar. And uh, there's a, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The word for seasons is actually hamoyadim, the appointed times is what it actually means. What's interesting, if you, if you are Jewish, you know that there are 52 Sabbaths, every Saturday is a Sabbath, plus there are seven days of Passover, plus there's a, see, in addition to the, the, the regular Sabbaths, there are a handful of other Sabbaths. Pa seven days of Passover. There's Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Yom Teror, the Feast of Trumpets. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's a seven-day thing. And uh, Shemi Atzeret, the Eighth Day of Assembly. To every Jew, he knows that there are how many appointed times? Seventy. Hamoyadim is encrypted only once at an interval of seventy. Now, the statistical expectation would be, just from the statistics of the letters, if you analyze it as a statistician, you'd expect that word to show up five times in the 78,000 letters of Genesis, just from statistical accidents. No, it only occurs once in Genesis, at an interval of 70, the exact number of appointed times, and it is centered on Genesis 1.14, where that idea is introduced. How many of you think that's just an accident? I don't think so. See, what we've learned from Ruth and from Jester is that there are no coincidences. There are two concepts in mathematics that you cannot find in the physical universe. One is infinity. We understand it, but we can't find any evidence of it. The, universe, the great discovery of 20th century science is the universe is finite, not infinite. At the large end and also the small end. You can't get infinitely small. You can't get smaller than a Planck length. It's a digital universe. So the other concept you cannot find in the physical universe is randomness. Scientists resort to what they call pseudo-random numbers where they need them, but they're not really random. They know that. And uh, so the randomness is elusive. The scripture says so. Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is in the lap of the Lord. And uh, 
Odds against this by unaided chance have been estimated at greater than 70 million to one. Well, we also have Yeshua codes. If Yeshua is who we think it is, Yaakov Ramsel published books, Yeshua and Yeshua, uh, Jesus is my name. He, uh, Yeshua appears at intervals of just de dealing with less than 100 intervals. Over 5,500 inches in the Old Testament. 2,900 going forward and 2,600 going backward. The volume of the book is written of me, Jesus says in Psalm 40, verse 8. Search the scriptures. They are, they, they are written of me. Boy, we didn't know the half of it. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Yeshua is able, is in the Hebrew. Genesis 3.27. Adam and Eve covered. Yoshiah, Yosh he will save. Ruth opens with a five interval sequence, Yeshua. Daniel 9, the 70 weeks, has a 26 letter interval of Yeshua. The word, the name Yeshua is all through the Bible. Isaiah 53, many people would call it the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. Encrypted in this short little chapter, Yeshua is my name, his signature, the Messiah, the Nazarene, the Galilee, Shiloh, Pharisee, Levites, Caiaphas, Annas, Passover, the man Herod, wicked Caesar, Parish, evil Roman city, let him be crucified. It goes on and on and on. But the thing that's really interesting about it, 53, isn't this. You have encrypted in 12 verses, within those 12 verses, all the people that were at the foot of the cross. Not all of them, but I mean a list of people that were. Peter, Matthew, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas. Two Jameses, not three. The third didn't become a believer until after his resurrection. Simon, Thaddeus, Matthias. There are three Marys, and there were. In fact, one of them is, the encryption is interwoven with the encryption of the name John. Ooh, that's interesting. Salome and Joseph. What's even more astonishing than these names encrypted in those 12 verses, there is a name that because of the frequency of letters, that letter is a name made of very high frequency letters. See, if you go through a frequency table, there are certain letters that are very high frequency that would have a high probability of happening by accident. If you go back to this list of, of uh, people here, there's a name that's not there that's astonishing that it's not there by accident. The name of Judas. The name of Judas is omission. is more startling statistically than the ones that are included here. Okay, let's get back to Esther. There's an equidistant letter sequence, interval of eight, starting in Esther chapter one, verse three. There it is laid out for you in the Hebrew. And if you take those four letters, it spells Mashiach, the Messiah. That's kind of exciting. That's tucked away in Esther. In Esther 4, seven, an equidistant letter sequence with an interval of eight. Again, a new beginning. And uh, we look at these letters and we discover that there again, we have Yeshua. Jesus. Esther 4.2. In this case, we have an equidistant letter sequence of seven. And we have here the El Shaddai, the Almighty. Okay. So those are three ELSs that Yaakov Ramsel wrote me a little note and pointed that out to me. And I, was, I checked it out. I, you know, there's, there's some work that goes into doing that. But then he sent me another one. He says, Chuck, you'll love this one. So this is, a, this, is a, this is an extra piece here. We've had five acrostics and three LSs. That's a nice eight. That's a good beginning. There's another one we'll just throw in here. No extra charge. At Esther chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, at an interval of six, we have, we take the first three, it makes a word. Um, and you make the hey, the, the mem, uh, it, Haman is not a surprise. That's Haman. Okay. And then you've got three or four letters that are the Vav is a connector, but the uh, you got the Shin, Mem, and uh, that's Satan. So you got Haman and Satan, Ruach, Ruach. Haman and Satan stink. <laughs> Now, I don't know what to make of it, <laughs> but I thought you'd get a kick out of that. There it is. Okay, 
Let's talk about the other end of things, macro codes, the large scale, the larger design elements, types, analogies, and so forth. When you compare Ruth and Esther, it's kind of interesting because Ruth, you had a Gentile woman, Esther, you have a Jewish woman. In Ruth, the Gentiles living among Jews, in Esther, the Jewish one is living among Gentiles. In um, Ruth, she marries a Jew, Boaz, in the royal line. Esther marries a Gentile who ruled the empire, also in, a royal, in his royal line. Ruth emphasizes the sovereignty of God, and Esther emphasizes the providence of God. God's name is uh, manifest in Ruth, uh, uh, the narrative of Ruth. God's name is not mentioned explicitly in Esther. Both stories, though, are monumental in their emphasis of that chance doesn't really exist. Chance is really God working undercover. And that's glib to talk about academically. It's important for us to remember that personally. Do you realize that every trouble you have is fathered, filtered, if you're in Christ? Yes, you'll have trouble, but they'll be there for a purpose, a specific purpose. Boy, what a comfort there is in that. To know that God really loves you. He really does. And you need to discover that. Now, we can get into homiletics. That's the, uh, you, you know, you normally, when you study a Bible, you start with exegesis. That is, what does the text really say? And most of us take the text we have in our hands as the, a, a reasonable approximation of that. The next level is exposition. That's what we usually do, is we exposit it verse by verse. What does it mean? First level, what does it say? Second, what does it really mean? Down a level or two is what the, is called homiletics. Okay, great. You have to answer the so what question. So what does it mean to me? How do I apply it? Okay. So we might talk a little bit, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the position of Esther's people was strikingly analogous to that of the unsaved men and women in general. Conscious of being under the judgment of God, the curse of the broken law hanging over their heads. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3.10, echoing Deuteronomy 27.26. Of course, God can say, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Why well, can't do that? Because of Jesus. That's what gr grace means. God's riches at Christ's expense. Huh? The Lord Jesus has borne the sinner's judgment. God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. These are fabulous verses. Thus the king can hold out the golden scepter toward us, just as Xerx Xerxes held out the golden scepter at Esther, our king can now hold out hold the, king, the golden scepter to us. In each case, by grace. Notice, Esther did not plead the good works, the benevolence, or the loyalty of the Jews in her plea. She didn't plead any of that. Like Paul, when entreating Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, writes, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. That's in effect what, that was the position Esther put herself in. Or as Paul says in Ephesians, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Or John 17, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou, this is Jesus in, in his uh, high priestly prayer, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them even as thou hast loved me. That's a staggering statement. That the Father loves us as much as he loves the Son. Can you imagine that? You can't possibly. We can't possibly embrace that. Now Haman was the one that had the power of death, but he's been destroyed. Aren't you glad? The commission we've been given is even more urgent than the one that they had dispatching after Haman's death. Men are in danger of something far worse than their temporal destruction. They are in danger of the eternal judgment of God against sin. Well, wow. The widespread indifference to the king's commandment is disturbing in this much vaunted century of progress and enlightenment that we claim. The apathy, the disinterest in God's message is astonishing. We've even removed it from our culture. It's illegal to have them in school and so on and so forth. Are we surprised that God has his wrath on this country? It's a wrath of abandonment. Uh, there's a litmus test to tell whether God has abandoned us or not. Is there still time or not? Is the wrath of abandonment started? You can tell by Romans 1, verse 18 to the end, of the th to verse 32. There's a test. 
a litmus test. God says, if they don't acknowledge me as a creator, I will give them over. Three times, he says, to that which is not convenient. Homosexuality is God's litmus test. Article in the, my wife called my attention to an article in the paper this morning, which points out that the church is losing against the gays, that the failure of the church to embrace the gay community is going to lead to the forfeiture of the 5013C treatment by the government. Is that clear? Are we surprised? Shouldn't be. Remember Proverbs 24, verse 11 and 12, to each of us, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? That's the watchman challenge, isn't it? There's one last thing that I find absolutely fascinating in the book of Esther. I sort of left it to last. There is a passage in the book of Esther. I know of no other passage in the Bible that is treated this peculiar way. It has to do with the ten sons of Haman. The words, the names of those ten sons are of Persian derivation. What's interesting is they are uniquely positioned on the page where they're inscribed. It's also interesting that on the Feast of Purim, when the synagogue reader is reading these ten names, he has to read all ten in one breath. And the reason the rabbis give is, well, it's because the sons of Haman all died together. Well, that might be the main reason, but there's also a strange connector here that's translated in your Bible as and, but it's a very strange use of the vav and the aleph and the tau. It's used reflexively. I'll get into that here for a little bit, but for those that are interested in this. They're listed in a remarkable way in a column, and the word self is linked with each name. Now, this, this peculiar elephant towel, this et term, is a pronoun that can, at once, if required, be placed in a position of emphasis. It is also sometimes enables a reflexive sense to be expressed with verbs of motion, which are very rare, denoting a goal. The vav ahead of that introduces the predicate or apodosis when it forms with the preceding word a pair, whether a parallel or opposed ideas. The vav that's the point, uh, point of this particular way is used very freely and widely in Hebrew, but also with much delicacy to express relations or shades of meaning which Western languages would usually indicate by distinct particles. This is not a commentary out of Esther. This is just an extraction from Whitaker's lexicon, which is one of the authorities, to give you a little feeling. There's this very strange word that's and in your English, but it's self, translated self, because it's reflexive, okay? So the first one is Parashadantha, the curious self. What do you mean curious? Well, he's the busybody, okay? He's the curious self. Delphon, the weeping self. Label that self-pity in our language. Aspatha. The assembled self, self-mobilized, self-sufficient, if you will. Paratha, the generous self, that's the spendthrift, the impulsive self, the self-indulgent one, if you will. Adelia, the weak self, self-consciousness, inferiority, if you will. Eridatha, the strong self, that speaks to assertiveness, insistence upon one's own way. Parmashta, the preeminent self, that one that speaks of ambition, desire for preeminence above over others, is what the uh, expression is. Arasai, the bold self, imprudent one, you might say. Eridai, the dignified self. Here we're speaking of pride or haughtiness, the sense of superiority. And finally, Vaisatha, the pure self. That's the one worst of all, the self-righteous one. Now what's interesting here, all these were put to death. All these are put to death. See, the death of the self-life is the first great evidence of having discovered the secret of your own victory. The death of self-life, amplified by the ten sons of Haman, that not only all died at one time, but they are spoken of in the Hebrew tradition all in one breath. All ten 
need to be put to death. Every one of us need to go through that list and see which one of those in our life has not been put to death yet. I leave that for you to consider as a possible hidden message in the book of Esther, which means something hidden. Well, Mordecai gave the, 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 the peak event dramatically in the, in the text, of course, was Mordecai, Mordecai's challenge to Esther. Remember? For such a time as this, we all remember that so vividly. So called are you. You're sitting in that seat right now by God's divine appointment. You may be placed right where you are precisely for such a time as this. Our country is over. It may not ever be repaired. There are serious changes afoot all over the world, but also right here in America. It's for such a time as this, and that's coming, that you're called to. What are you called to? That's the, that's the adventure of life. Find out through prayer and fasting what it is God has called you to do. For such a time as this, so called are you. Psalmist tells us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We are to number our days. How many days do you have left? I remember I was dealing with a Jewish financier. We were in a project together on a board. And uh, I said, Bernie, how many weekends you got left? He looked at me kind of funny. Well, pick your number. 10 years, 20 years, 10 years. Let's say 20 years. What's that? A thousand weekends, isn't it? Give or take. He looked at me shocked. See, when you say 20 years, that's academic. It doesn't rattle when you shake it, right? But if I say you've got a thousand weekends left, whoa, you want to start counting, maybe, huh? I remember I shook him up quite a bit. I ran into him years later at an airport. We had long, that other project, long went its own way. But we ran into the airport, and he looked at me. Chuck, what is it? About 800 left? <laughs> I knew what he meant. He was giving a horseback guess as to how many weekends were left out of the thousand we talked about. So don't talk about days, thousands of days. That doesn't sort of, that's too abstract. 20 years to, or 10 years, pick your number. You can all figure out, you have an estimate of what you think you've got left. It might be one. We never know what a day brings on that sense. But on the other hand, Scripture tells us to teach us to number our days. How many days do you have left? And uh, why? So that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Every day that goes by gives you an opportunity to improve your report card before the Bema Seat of Christ. Your salvation has been paid for by Jesus Christ. If you've accepted Christ, he's done the whole deal. Your passport is stamped not guilty. You enter heaven. But entering doesn't mean you inherit. Your inheritance will be a reward for your faithfulness what you've accomplished for him. Not out of your energy, out of your responsiveness to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So my question, closing question as we finish the study, what is your action plan? Esther knew what she had to do. Tremble though she might, she had to go see the king under conditions of the threat of death. Most of us aren't exactly in that position. But we have a calling, every one of us. And it's not the same for any two of us here. Each one's distinctive. And the great adventure in your life is to discover what it is that God has called you to do. In that spirit, let's close, stand for a closing word of prayer.